the growth in demand that there's going to be a lot more mouths to feed in, in Asia generally, the production not growing in Australia, is that something that can be changed? Do you need a, a bigger incentive or is it just impractical on a, on a global market that that's just the way things are and production is not going to grow here? Well, hopefully, um, hopefully um, it, it will, and, and we've sort of explained where where I think it will do, and it needs it needs the complete picture um, to be to be coloured in. Though uh, we need far better um, water, rail, and road infrastructure. Um, we need to be able to reach new production zones where we capture a lot of rain. We need to be able to move our water around. But absolutely, I think you know Australian farmers have proven. Um, great ability to innovate and adapt and there is genuine interest to build large scale. Um, perhaps we need to look at our um, debt capital markets because Australian farmers are generally very conservative and it might be holding back uh, opportunities to borrow for the long term with flexible debt uh, to enable greater scale to be built. But absolutely, I think once we've got those things and we leverage the free trade agreements fully, um, it is an opportunity to build real scale. And do you see the, where do you see the product mix in terms of bulk commodities, in terms of raw commodities versus value-added products? Well, I think Australia is very famous for, um, for becoming more specialised in, in meat, um, in certain dairy, in fruit and veg. But clearly, we are a major, major player in bulk commodities. Uh, and that's you know, equally important for, for uh, regional infrastructure solutions and water and you know to get our our wheat and our cotton and, and those sorts of things um, into the market at a lower cost and higher volume will will be the only solution for australia to compete especially when um, w when russia and the ukraine and, and other markets really start to open up and they have the infrastructure to enable faster delivery to china that's that's our real threat if we don't if we don't get it right. Mm. Now, just a reminder: if you do want to ask a question, head to one of the microphones. Uh, there's plenty of things that we can be talking about over the next little while. Uh, another question, though, I might put this to both of you, uh, and a little bit of a devil's advocate one: Are we putting too much emphasis on Asia? Are we putting all our eggs in one basket? Can we afford to do anything else? <laughs> yeah. So, so my perspective on that is. Uh, you know, what's the alternative? Mm. Uh, and, and so Doug gave statistics where more than half the world's population uh, is going to be in our hemisphere, in, in Asia. Um, more than that as a share of, uh, you know, purchasing power. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, Asia is not one basket. Mm. And so, for example, in wine, uh, Australian wine exports to China have grown very strongly. In, in, in the last five years or so, uh, that's actually diversified our wine export market. So we used to be very heavily concentrated uh, in exporting to the UK. Uh, it was, from memory, about 40, 45% mm -hmm. of the total exports went to that one market. Now the UK is down to 12% or so, and China has uh, taken up that slack, basically. So we've by expanding into Asia in the next decade or two, it's probably mostly diversification um, because uh, even within China, as Doug was saying, there's you know dozens of different market niches. Uh, so, so there are some uh, specifics, and it does go to government relations and non-tariff barriers and those sorts of things in part, um, but it, it's a very large basket and we can't afford to ignore it. So. Doug, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think that... Um, we're still um, very focused on the Middle East um, and on EU free trade agreements that are, will be negotiated. I think you know we don't want to have all of our eggs in one basket, but you know the demographics and the wealth generation coming out of Asia is undeniable, and I think that's where we need to be putting, you know, certainly in terms of government resources. Uh, I think that's where we need to be putting our troops, especially uh, to help solve some of these non-tariff issues, which seem to be the real crux of the issue. Well, can you give us a couple of examples of, of how that's been played out? Yeah, well, <coughs> look, um, there's been a number of high profile and public um, issues in non-tariff um, matters. Uh, firstly, in infant formula. I think everyone's aware that um, some of the Australian listed infant formula companies have come under very acute pressure uh, as a result of Chinese regulators. Uh, my understanding is that um, while the companies have been registered and licensed for importation of infant formula, it then um, 
changed to be the specific product brands that needed to be uh, also licensed and registered, and that was by a different government agency in China, and that's caused um, some concern. It's caused some delay in helping get our uh, infant formula into market. In the beef sector, um, very high profile um, three month hiatus last year, which cost Australian um, beef exporters, frozen beef exporters, about a million dollars a day uh, as a result of um, technical non tariff issues, but possibly also to do with um, government to government negotiations on market access. So it's not always a technical issue, it can also be a, a bigger issue uh, when it comes to China. At the moment, um, everyone's been extremely excited about getting chilled beef into, into China. That was announced when Premier Li Keqiang came to Australia uh, last year. But unfortunately, despite all of the excitement and effort by Australian uh, producers, uh, none of the protocols for the importation of chilled beef and beef co-products have been resolved as yet. Australia is waiting on Chinese regulators to provide direction for the conclusion of these matters. Mm. So these are the sorts of issues. And in, in Indonesia, we've got the halal certification. In Malaysia, we've got halal certification issues as well. Um, these things can, can really uh, put a lot of pressure, particularly on a small and medium-sized exporter. And you touched on this too, but it, it, is there a risk that that makes people think, it's too hard, why do we bother? Why don't we just focus on something that's easier? Of course, there's a, there's a risk in, um, where there's a greater opportunity to export to um, safer markets like uh, Japan um, mm. or um, uh, Western markets or even into the domestic Australian and New Zealand market, then people will, will hedge. They mm. won't be all or nothing. Um, but clearly, um, again, going back to where I think Austrade's efforts and the Department of Ag's efforts are and certainly where KPMG's efforts are, there's an there's enormous amount of collaboration that's that's coming into play uh, to help Australian companies that need to just focus on on producing the very best products at the lowest cost and getting it to the market fastest but there's a lot of there's a lot of teamwork that can be applied by the professional services industry the banking sector and the government organizations I've got a very brave man ready to ask a question I might just get you to introduce yourself before you ask your question thank you Colin Grant and I'm a recent retiree but interested in this game. Um, and I, I do feel a bit uh, out here, I have to say. Um, <laughs> Don't worry, you're in a safe space. OK. <laughs> Look, given what we've heard today about you know, the growth demand coming from Asia, uh, the potential for, for the future, the lack, of <laughs> the lack of investment in Australia in the infrastructure and, uh, and technology in this area, why is it, given that the, the, there's the obvious potential growth, why is it, you think, and I'd like your comments, that the retirement investment industry in Australia, which is sitting on billions, trillions in fact, isn't putting it into this game where the growth is there, and yet the Canadian investment, uh, retirement investment industry, particularly its teacher investment industry, is. Um, there's a big pool of money there, and the question is, why isn't it being? Why is that industry sector not looking at and seeing this game? Thank you. Okay, so it is. Thanks for the question. I think everyone heard the question. Why isn't Australia's superannuation funds, which is amongst the largest pool of passive capital in the world, not investing in infrastructure and, and agri? Uh, it is starting to. Um, there's 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 more activity in the last two or three years uh, than ever. Um, but it comes down to two things, uh, economic returns and tenor of return. So a lot of the superannuation funds are now structured on highly liquid short-term investment opportunity strategies because they need to have liquid uh, capital to withdraw. And investments into agri large-scale agriculture and critical infrastructure requires a very long-term approach, and it's different for the Canadian pension funds, I understand. Um, my personal view is, is that um, for very critical nation-building infrastructure, uh, it requires uh, federal and state governments to, to lead, to fund uh, first phase, and then once the assets are operating and are proving to deliver uh, measurable returns, then they can be privatised. 
and that's where the superannuation funds will be very keen to buy into. I just don't think they want to take the development risk. We have another question. Growth Tasmania, am I on? You're on. Good. <laughs> Sorry. Um, look, my question is for Doug, and it's around attitudes to foreign investment. Um, certainly in Tasmania, uh, <coughs> Chinese investment has been crucial um, to development there, in particular getting that sort of um, direct transport, yeah. uh, flights into China of milk. Um, you mentioned food security as a concern. You did mention some other concerns people have that are maybe obstacles to accepting foreign investment. One that I guess I've observed, um, and it doesn't just imply to foreign investment but perhaps to business in general, um, is concerns about uh, influence or connections between the business and government and undue influence perhaps in democratic processes, and a fear about that. Uh, certainly something that's been raised in The Economist. I'm just wondering, Doug, what sort of changes do you think could be delivered, perhaps by government, that would deliver the sort of transparency that would allow people to be more accepting of foreign investment? Thank you for the question. It's an important one. I had expected this to come up. Uh, so I think we need to be consistent um, with all government-linked corporations and, and not be just focused on China, <clears throat> although at the moment they're the ones that are the most active. But Singaporean investors uh, are the same. You know, We've had in the past UK and US investors that have been partially or wholly owned by governments. <clears throat> There's a lot more awareness and concern, obviously, in uh, federal government and state government departments now around um, the, the, the concerns around influence and connections with, with government. Um, there has been a tightening of the Foreign Investment Review Board um, investment thresholds. Uh, the new chairman of the Foreign Investment Review Board has a very long and distinguished uh, security history. Um, so he's, he's coordinating all government departments to look into, into these things. What, uh, what we've seen um, in the last couple of years and really around the, the Kidman deal was a new model and I think the government has very clearly shown its strong preference for a partnership between uh, Australian and foreign investors where it's led by an Australian shareholder uh, in a majority sense. The properties and the businesses are managed by Australians, uh, but with the growth in capital and support and also the ability to facilitate export growth coming from the Asian partner. Um, in that case, it wasn't an SOE involved, but I will say that I think that uh, for very large scale Australian agricultural land and uh, land that's got valuable water assets, that is in fact a, a very good working model. As long as we can communicate that consistently and clearly to all foreign investors before running a process, then I think we have, we have the right to, to make that our, our prerequisite or our strong priority if we can. And just a quick follow up on that. Do you think that there's room for more transparency from the Asian investor side of things? People perhaps acting more in a more public way, doing more uh, town hall meetings and being more present in the media, things like that? Yes, I do. I, I, I really um, think it's important that um, Asian investors approach the Australian market um, very thoughtfully and respectfully, that they look to uh, appoint um, senior representatives that um, have experience here or have had experience in other Western mm -hmm. markets that can communicate um, comfortably in, in English that take advice from, from firms like ours and that can really um, paint a picture with local communities about job creation, about community assets uh, that, that can be built and, and enjoyed, educational facilities, etc. This is part of the social contract and I think Chinese companies 
um, are learning this and there's been some, some really good research. Uh, Powell Tate, uh, a PR company, put out a report uh, last year about social licence to operate and it does a lot of case study analysis of, of Chinese investments that are working very well, like Cubby. Um, and it also looks at some of the ones uh, in Gippsland, et cetera, that didn't go well because the investors didn't understand the importance of engagement with the community. Okay. We have another question from the floor. Hey, my name's Warren Mails. I'm with Cane Growers out of Queensland. A question for Doug, and I'm sure Steve might want to comment as well. Um, Doug, you painted a really optimistic uh, picture of the future and demand in Asia and possible growth in northern Australia for agriculture and the investment required there particularly around, around water and irrigation infrastructure. The problem that we've got in Queensland at the minute is that electricity pricing and water pricing is actually driving people from intensive irrigated agriculture back to extensive dryland farming. So uh, given those, those existing policy structures and given the drivers there, how do you reconcile your vision of the future for the need for, for, for further irrigation, for need for further investment in infrastructure in northern Queensland with current policy settings, uh, it seems to me that they're, they're pulling in different directions. I welcome your comment. Oh. <laughs> Thanks for the question. I, um, I'm not a, a policy maker or, or a politician. I, I think that um, Andrew Robb and then Josh Frydenberg have been very clear about their um, hopes for northern Australia and I hope that North Queensland is part of that as well. Um, look, energy pricing is something that serves to remind all of us that uh, we need to be careful when locking into long-term contracts uh, with foreign companies to export um, and the impact that that can have, unforeseen impact that can have quite suddenly on, on uh, pricing. So I think that that's relevant to food as well. Um, I think that the situation requires, uh, it's chicken and egg, it requires investment capital. And there are, as I've pointed out, interested investors uh, aligned to the Belt and Road Initiative that could deliver the sort of infrastructure solutions that, that the Northern Australian market needs for power for road and rail and water. This is what Chinese construction and engineering companies do probably better and more cost effectively than anyone in the world. But we need to, we need to see uh, clear signs as to whether that is encouraged or, or whether it will continue because we're sending mixed signals at the moment uh, and it's probably more likely that they feel as though um, Australia isn't as welcoming for critical infrastructure um, particularly around ports, etc., uh, than it was, say, five years ago. Yeah, um, thanks, Doug. Th thanks, Warren, for, for the question, and I won't pretend to be uh, 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 fully across the Queensland story, so I won't comment on Queensland in particular, but it's interesting to contrast uh, what's happening in electricity and what's happening uh, in water. So in electricity at the, at the small purchaser, the retail uh, and, and SME level, more than half the bill uh, relates to uh, network distribution assets. Uh, a lot of the cost of those assets, um, often more than 20% in some areas, uh, relates to servicing uh, four to eight hours of demand a year. Okay, so we've engineered our engineering, uh, our electricity systems to be really, really secure, but really, really expensive. And in a lot of ways, uh, we've done the opposite in water. We've recognised that water is very variable, and we've built that into the design of the system. So, so it's clear uh, we need to do more. We need to do better. Uh, we need our electricity to be more uh, competitive than it is at the moment and we need to think carefully about uh, how we invest in water infrastructure to make the best use of what we've got when we've got it. Thank you. Now we've got a few people standing up the back there. I presume you're not just stretching your legs, I can only half see you. Uh, have you been waiting for ages? Uh, not, not, not too sure, I okay, guess. Okay, well, let, let's go with while. you. Yeah. Um, so, is the microphone on or? Okay. Yeah. Was it? Yep, go for it. Uh, so my name is Han Xiong Xia. I am a Northern Territory farmer, the other state over Queensland. Um, one thing, we're talking about international trade and export. 
Uh, one thing that what we have noticed in the last couple of years, also, like what little Dr. Little, uh, Minister uh, Little Proud came to Northern Territory last month, indicated that um, you know being free trade or being, being part of export, you also have to give back in return, so importation. Um, what we've noticed in the last couple of years is that you know we grow pomelos and we have in inundation of pomelos from the United States and Israel at the exactly same time as when we're trying to supply the market in Australia. And we've also been um, having the same effect on other growers in the Northern Territory for dragon fruit when Vietnamese dragon fruits are coming in at exactly the same time when Northern Territory uh, dragon fruit are coming in. And just recently it's been announced is that when the Indonesian mangoes are coming in at the same time as sorry, Darwin uh, mango season will be coming in. Our mango season that we're looking at is at $88 million in Northern Territory. It does half the Australian population um, of production for Australia. And we're concerned that, should we be concerned or should we look at doing something in return that you know, would benefit the Australian growers um, versus having a pretty much we'll sold a trade dump on Australia f yeah. um, markets from imported products. So your question's around the dual, duality, I suppose, of free trade markets and that they can cut both ways. Yeah, kind of like that. And whether um, is it fair to actually have products from overseas coming at the same, exactly the same time as local production. Doug, I'll throw that one your way. Jeez, yeah. I wish David had hung around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he, uh, he said he walked, he said it was a, um, you got to give some to re in return for exporting, I guess, so. Yeah, so, so these often aren't strictly as uh, quid pro quo, and, and it really depends on the, uh, the exact details. So if, so if you've got, um, uh, us exporting and uh, and importing from countries which are sharing the same uh, the seasons are in sync uh, you would expect a degree of production happening at the same time there's often a lot of differentiation on quality grounds or segments within the in the industry that means trade is is a sensible thing to uh, to have so in seafood for example uh, we um, export a lot of prawns and we import a lot of prawns but they're different types of prawns so so it cuts both ways um, but but it is important that policy settings and and how we arrange it uh, are alive to the notion of dumping dumping is real and can happen and we need to uh, to guard against that okay we're rapidly running out of time so I just want to get to these two final questions at the front here maybe starting with you sir hello uh, thanks Nikolai um, my name is Paul Fox and I'm a director of a company called Agronomics Australia. Um, I'm actually, uh, my background's aviation, so, but I am proud to say this is my third ABARES conference. So Steve, um, some feedback. Um, I've been to a lot of conferences in a lot of sectors and this is a fantastic event. So it's a, a not to be missed from our point of view. Um, I'd just like to respond to a comment made by Doug um, and a bit of a clue here with the aviation background. Um, yeah. And I'm sort of breaking a, the golden rule here by making a comment rather than a, uh, a right, full well, question. Let's keep it brief. So I will. <laughs> um, we've actually been modelling an air freight network um, for uh, perishable, uh, high-value Australian products between Australia and China. Uh, we're two years into that project. Uh, the project will include a new airport in central Victoria uh, for wide-bodied traders uh, to access all of that. Um, we are one of the reasons we're here is we're keen to talk to um, you know, major producers you know, to finalise our demand side modelling. Um, but I do have a, a question uh, just to add on to the end of that, um, Doug. From your perspective, um, just how important is the food security and traceability um, side of things from a branding and marketing point of view into the Chinese market? Uh, it couldn't be more important. It's um, it's the the um, for the target market we're trying to reach, um, they're very discerning when they buy online. Um, they are um, very keen to ensure uh, that our uh, product is um, coming from, from the highest standard of regulatory oversight for, for food biosecurity, and that's why Australia stands out. Um, so I think um, it is a very important thing because there's a lot of nervousness in China around um, um, food that's been um, over, overly um, fertilised or, or washed or grown in, in, in products and, and inputs that are, that are very unhealthy for consumers. So this is, um, this is a very important thing that we need to absolutely sustain 
Uh, and I t touched on the, and I think Ian will probably talk about it, my colleague Ian Proudfoot will probably talk about the single window uh, using blockchain to, to speed up and give uh, importers full visibility of product tracing. But we've been doing it very well. Um, Pat Hutchison he here today you know, can talk about um, what we've done in the, in the meat sector to ensure that we have the highest level of traceability. And I think it's a really standout advantage for us. And I'm really pleased to hear that you're um, going ahead with a, with a Victorian air freight hub. I think there's room for maybe four or five more in Australia. And just imagine where we'll be if we can get our uh, product on a larger scale to Asian supermarkets faster and cheaper than our competitors. That's a game changing move, so you know, good luck. Yeah, thanks Doug. And we are looking at other sites for that down the track as well. Thank you. Very interesting. And ma'am, final question. Hi, uh, my name is Madison Corlett from Murdoch Uni. Um, just had a question. I know there's a lot of negative attitudes towards the foreign investment, such as China. Um, but my own question that I want to learn a bit more on is, do these investors represent Australia and Australia's industry or do they represent their own private interests? Um, so they, they obviously represent their own private interests. Uh, they represent the companies that they own or they manage. Um, and they're interested in um, increasing um, their ability to uh, import Australian produce back to their, their home country and to control the supply chain. Um, increasingly, they're aware of the issues we've discussed around compliance and building a social licence to operate and that if they come in in a cavalier um, or careless uh, manner that, that there will be a very significant backlash um, to them. So I think in Australia's highly energised media sector, uh, and with the government oversight and the community interest that's in this at the moment, I think they're very clearly aware of, of what they need to do in terms of their, their corporate behaviour. But obviously they are representing um, their own uh, interests, but at the same time creating um, commitments to invest further capital and also to employ more Australians. There's not going to be a change, I don't think, in our immigration laws to allow you know, loads of lower cost um, unskilled labour to come in and replace, but there might be an opportunity to supplement. So I hope I answered your question. It's, it's, it's really, we have to be you know, clear-eyed about what their, what their um, objectives are, that we have to work with them. And, I, and that's why I said this partnership model has to be um, very ca carefully uh, pursued by Australians. Yeah, I'd just like to, to echo that. So media um, reporting, uh, apart from apart the from the country hour, hour. Yeah, apart from the country hour, uh, is sometimes a bit shallow. And certainly, if you ask, you know, general public opinion of big business, uh, without mentioning any country, uh, it won't always be very favourable. But it, it's important that we tell the story that we're in this together. That different. Um, players, government and business and landowners and so forth, consumers are all in this together uh, and it's uh, what we can do together uh, for Australia and for the agricultural sector is bigger than what any of us can achieve by ourselves. So for me that's why the partnership is one vehicle for stronger engagement um, so we get supply chain intelligence across the supply chain rather than imagining we know everything uh, is really, really important. But then it's incumbent on all of us to tell that story better than we have, to explain the, the benefits for regional employment, uh, that it unlocks capital, that we now know how to do things better because we've got partners on the other side of the water uh, who are helping us understand what, what we're targeting and what we need to do to succeed.